worthy of our praise, worthy of our adoration and love. So Lord, we come into this place confessing that we're weak. You know our struggles. You know our, our brokenness. You know the places that we failed this week. And yet you love us anyway. You're waiting for us with open arms. You're waiting to, to encourage us, to fill us with your strength, with your love, with your power. And so, Father, this morning we simply come and we surrender all that we are to you. Asking that you would meet us in this place. Asking that we would sense your presence, your love, your power. And most of all, that your truth would penetrate our lives and change us so that we might live as sons and daughters of the living God. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to invite you to grab your uh, Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 5, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. They look just like this. Turn to page 507. And, uh, and by the way, if you need a Bible, feel free to take one of these with you. As long as you're going to read it, that's cool. We want you to have the Word of God and use the Word of God and let it be part of your life. Hey, uh, for those of you that uh, know and have been asking or haven't had a chance, I just got back from Thailand uh, Tuesday night, traveled there with uh, 11 other members of Calvary. We had an amazing time, saw God do just tremendous things in the lives of people. And, and I want to thank you for your prayers, those of you that uh, were worried about us going, uh, given the world uh, and everything. Uh, I just uh, want you to know that it was a tremendous trip. We uh, we had a chance to travel through the country doing medical clinics and uh, speaking in schools. We shared the gospel with about 1,300, 1,400 people, one-on-one uh, -on -one and in groups. We saw 15 people trust Christ as their Savior, and, uh, which was really cool. And we, uh, that, that's, it, you know, it may not sound like a lot for as many people as we shared with, but in a country that is 99.5% not Christian, uh, that was pretty cool. We had uh, about 30 others say, uh, we want to know more. We want to do some studies. We want to hear about this in, in more depth. Uh, and so we just had a great time. So I got, like I said, so I got to do amazing things. And if you're sitting there going, man, I wish I'd gone. It's okay. We're going to go back. So you can sign up next time. And those of you that are all freaking out going, I could never do that because I can't eat weird food. You can handle it. They got American restaurants all over the place. So, uh, as long as you can live on, uh, like, Pizza Hut and KFC, you're good. So, because uh, <laughs> I can. And uh, anyway, my favorite Thai restaurant now is, you know, KFC. So uh, <laughs> anyway, hey, uh, you ever get something in your shoe when you're out walking, you know, like a little pebble or a sticker or something like that? Anybody have that happen to them? Yeah, we all do, yeah. And, and what do you do when, when uh, that happens and you got that pebble in your shoe? What, what do you guys do? Oh, you sit down and you take it off and, and you get it out from your shoe. You, you don't just like keep walking going, ow, ow, ow. Yeah, you don't leave it in there because there's nothing redemptive about the pain, right? It's just going to hurt more and more and more and more and, and eventually uh, uh, get worse. So you take it out, you, do, you uh, do it on purpose. Now, have any of you ever put something in your shoe on purpose that hurt a little bit? No? I bet some of you have. See, I see some hands up. I did. 25 years ago, I was diagnosed with plantar fasciitis, which is just the fancy way of saying bone spurs in your heels. And, uh, and, and I didn't like that. I mean, the pain was intense. I was active. I was playing basketball. I was playing tennis. I was walking on the golf course. And, and I'd sit down. I'd try to stand back up. And the pain would be so great that it caused me to fall to my knees. And they were talking surgery and stuff. And I, I had a podiatrist who said, hey, let me cast your foot. We'll try these hard orthotics uh, before you... Uh, uh, go to surgery. So he gave them to me and I put them in my shoes and at first it felt like a giant rock was in my shoe. I mean, it was, it was awkward. It hurt. Uh, it was uncomfortable. And he said, look, trust me, just get used to it and, and everything will get better. And so I, I endured through the pain for a little while. And what happened is over a course of a couple of days, it stopped hurting. Not just the awkward uncomfortableness of having the orthotics, but the pain of the bone spurs went away. And so the short-term pain healed me of the long-term pain so that I could live a healthy, active life. 
So today, I'm going to challenge you to embrace some short-term, uncomfortable pain in order to get to a healthier place spiritually in your life. We're talking about character. And we're beginning the discussion talking about Nehemiah's integrity. Uh, we're in Nehemiah chapter 5. And if you don't know the story of Nehemiah, he was a, a Jewish slave to the, the king of Persia. King Artaxerxes, and uh, he heard about Jerusalem, how the, the city was in distress, the walls were broken down, the people were a mess, and he asked the king if he could go and build the walls, and the king gave him permission and gave him resources, and he traveled to Jerusalem, and his task was to build the walls, and of course he did that, that's what the book of Nehemiah is about, it's in the Bible there, but he did more than that. Because of Nehemiah's integrity, he built a community. He helped them become a nation again that was healthy and strong. And the ripple effect of his commitment uh, to that integrity lasted at least 500 years until the time of Christ. We still see the impact of the decisions that Nehemiah made and the way that he built them back into the people of God. And, and so I want you to see what his integrity did. First of all, Nehemiah defended the weak. Pick up in chapter 5 verse 1. It says, now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. It's always important to eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. Listen to Nehemiah's response. He says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us? They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as I had promised, or as they had promised. Now, see, what was happening was, was this. The rich of Jerusalem were making a profit and were enslaving the poor of Jerusalem. Uh, remember that Jerusalem was a, a, a city that had been destroyed. The people had been taken into exile. They'd been sold as slaves to the nations. And now they were coming home. They, they were given permission to go back. And they were going back and they had nothing. They had no goods, they had no money, they, they were poor, and they got there, and other people were working their ancestral lands. See, everybody was given a portion when the, the Israelites occupied the promised land, but other people were working their fields and their vineyards, and they couldn't take them back. And, and so there they were living in poverty, and they were so poor that they had to sell their kids into slavery so they could stay alive. Now remember, they're trying to come back and build a nation again, trying to be the people of God again. Uh, God is restoring them, and yet the rich are taking advantage of the poor. And Nehemiah, who happened to be in a position of influence, sees this, and he hears about this, and he goes, this is not right. And I love verse 7. Did you catch this? He says, I took counsel with myself. Isn't that kind of funny? It strikes some of you as funny. Took counsel with myself. What does that mean? Well, it, it means a couple of things. First of all, he didn't go to the nobles and the officials who were oppressing the people and try to convince them that they ought to do something different. He didn't go play the politics. He didn't go schmoozing, uh, you know, and say, hey, guys, you know, what you're doing, it's not, you know, it's not good. You guys should do it. Well, maybe let's, let's, let's change some stuff. No. 
He knew that this was wrong, and he said, we're not going to put up with this. We're not going to do this. This is not right. And so he just brought them all together, and he said, guys, what you're doing is not right. Now, some of you may be going, eh, why is it not right? First of all, the Mosaic law forbid Jews to exact interest against each other. In other words, they couldn't practice uh, loan sharking with each other. They could do it with us, that's fine, but they couldn't do it with anybody else. They couldn't do it within their own nation. God was trying to create a community of people that respected and helped each other. And so he said, first of all, you're breaking the law of Moses by doing this. Secondly, by holding on to their property, they were also breaking the law of Moses. You guys have heard about the Sabbath, right? Work six days, take one off. Well, it also applied to property and indentured servanthood. In other words, if you sold your property to somebody... You really were just renting it to them because after six years, you got it back. It was your ancestral property. Your family got to keep it. it. That was the Sabbath year. On the seventh year, they returned the property. On the seventh year, if you served as an indentured servant, you could sell yourself to be somebody's servant, but on the seventh year, you got to be set free. That was how the society was supposed to work by God. They were disregarding all of that. And Nehemiah just said, look, guys, this is wrong. Stop it. And you know what happened? They all listened to him. And there's a whole lot more of them than of the rich guys than Nehemiah. They listened to him and said, you know what? You're right. We repent. And they gave the property back. And, and Nehemiah's integrity changed the dynamic of the entire community because he challenged the unethical status quo. Isn't that amazing? And, and, and he began to create a, a people again that could be a nation and treat one another with respect and dignity. So Nehemiah's integrity is seen in defending the weak. And then you see Nehemiah's integrity and in that he paid his own way. Continue the story, verse 14. It says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall and we acquired no land and all of my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all of this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Okay, so Nehemiah is the governor, and previous governors had taxed the people, legitimately so, so that they could live a lavish lifestyle. They were the rulers, and you know, as governors, they lived like kings because they were under the authority of the king of Persia. And so they just went and said, hey, you owe us this money, and they took the money from the people who were poor so that they could live high on the hog. Nehemiah saw that, and he said, this is not right. I'm not going to do this. He cared more about the people's struggles than he did about his own bank account. And so for 12 years, he paid the tab out of his own money for himself and 150 guests. That's a person of integrity. That's a person of integrity. In fact, Nehemiah's integrity changed a community. Now, we've been talking about the 35 to 40,000 people in Lake Havasu City that are unchurched. And we've been talking about how it's our responsibility before God to, to lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to know his grace, his mercy, his love on a personal level. And if we want to impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to be people of integrity. I hope you can see that. If we as a church, if we as individuals are going to impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have to be people of integrity. So let's talk about Calvary's integrity. Character is one of our core values here at Calvary. We have four core values, calling, character, connection, and change. And character is, we put it this way. 
We cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Does that make sense? We're, we're trying to represent Jesus to the world, and, and if we're not reflecting his character, we can't do it. And, and one of the problems in this country is that too many churches, too many pastors, too many pulpits are trying to represent Jesus without attempting to reflect his character. And the world sees that, and the world calls us what? Oh, you guys know too. Okay. See, and so we're, we're serious about this. If we're going to represent Jesus, we've got to reflect his character. And because we teach it, we try to live it, and, and we try to live it out by embracing a couple of values. Here at Calvary, we try to develop a culture of accountability. Accountability. Um, I learned the value of this the hard way. Because 13 years ago, we hired uh, an embezzler to be on our staff. Now, give us credit. We didn't know he was an embezzler at the time. Okay? Otherwise, we wouldn't have hired him. He was a con man. He faked his resume. He, he actually had people lie to be his references. Uh, everything was a lie. And he almost killed Calvary Christian Academy and tried to divide the church. And so we learn from that mistake. We don't want to be that stupid again. So we trust people, but we validate. That's what accountability is. It's saying, hey, we're going to validate what you say. It's not that we're not going to believe you, but we're just going to make sure that what you're telling us is true. So uh, we have a culture of accountability, and it includes, includes things like this. We do a background check on everyone who works with our children or our teenagers. No exceptions. And when I say no exceptions, I'm, that means that I, as a pastor, fill out a background check form every couple of years because that's how, good, how long the background checks are good for. And we don't make exceptions because we value the protection, the safety of our kids. And every now and then somebody will protest and say, well, you guys know me and I shouldn't have to fill out a background check and, and I don't want to do that. And we just say, no. The safety of our children is more important than the pride of anyone. And so we're going to either, you're either going to fill out a background check or you're not going to work with our kids. It's that simple. That's what accountability looks like. And then all of the pastors and our deacons have accountability software on our computers and our smartphones and our tablets and anything that connects to the Internet. Why do we do that? Because we want to make sure that we have a deterrent from going and looking at websites that are nasty. Okay? That's just why it's there. And we do it because that removes the temptation. It really does. If you think about it, yeah, am I going to go look at that website? Because if I do, I have to have a conversation that goes like this. Hey, uh, I noticed that you were looking at this website. You want to talk about that? Because you're supposed to be a spiritual leader. See, I don't want to have that conversation with anyone, and I'm pretty sure they don't want to have it with me. So it's great accountability. We practice financial accountability here at Calvary. We take handling God's money seriously. And we know that you're trusting us to handle it correctly, and so we do that. So real simple things like no one handles cash alone, two check signers on every check. And by the way, pastors don't write checks or sign checks in this church. Uh, we have a stewardship team. Uh, we got three people on staff that handle the money. We got three volunteers that oversee all of the expenses, all of the, the uh, decisions that are made with finances. And we do an outside annual review by a CPA every year. We go above and beyond because we want you guys to trust us. We understand that accountability requires validation. Uh, and then everyone who's in leadership, whether they're paid or volunteers, we've all signed a leadership covenant. Something that you see if you do the ethos class, which I, I think everybody ought to do the ethos class, whether you want to be a leader or not. Uh, but uh, at the end of that class, we share a, a leadership covenant. It's a standard of behavior or conduct of saying, hey, we're going to live this way. And if not, you can hold us accountable because we've agreed to. You see, we've embraced a culture of accountability because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And, and then we've embraced the, the practice of transparency. Transparency is one of our values. We really think it's important. Uh, so we're not pretending to be something that we're not, and we don't want you to pretend to be something that you're not. Uh, because all of us are sinners. We have it on good authority, it's called the Bible, that every one of us has rebelled. Every one of us has messed up. Every one of us has defied God. Romans 3.10 says there's no one who's righteous, not even one. 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means all of us means all of us. So when I stand here before you, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I know that you're sinners. And so why are we pretending that we're not 
And by the way, here at Calvary, we're not afraid of your mistakes. We know you've got a past. We've got a past too. And so we're not afraid of mistakes. In fact, we rejoice in the power of God to redeem our rebellion and restore our lives. That's why we love people telling their stories of failure and how God has, has put their life back together and given them victory. Um, and in truth, we look for leaders who have failed and seen God redeem their lives. And some of you are going, you guys are looking for leaders who have failed? Yes, here's why. In a lot of churches, the people in leadership, well, they pretend that they've got it all together. Okay, you guys know this. If you've been in church any time at all, there's kind of that pressure. You want to be seen as better than you really are. And, and so we, we kind of try to hide our failures of the past. Or if we talk about them, everything that we did wrong was in the past. Well, I used to sin, but I've gotten over that now. <laughs> Don't struggle anymore. And so we begin, to, we begin to create this facade that we're better than we are. And, and if we actually, in those churches, if you actually admit your, your failures or you admit you're, you're still struggling, then it will disqualify you for leadership. So all the people in leadership are all pretending that they're better than they are, and it creates this really sick, dysfunctional dynamic. Think about this. You've got a bunch of messed up liars who are leading a bunch of messed up honest people. <laughs> right? So I don't think God's going to show up in power in that kind of situation. So we're just, we're just up front about transparency. Uh, we like people in leadership who have been broken and discover the power of God to redeem. Because they're, they're not tempted to pretend. And in fact, they've discovered the power of confession and they know what it is to receive the grace of God and they know what it is to give the grace of God. So uh, transparency and accountability because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And I believe that the integrity of Calvary is having an impact on Lake Havasu City. So we talked about Nehemiah's integrity. We talked about Calvary's integrity. Let's talk about personal integrity. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal, and you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment with your life to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, then you are a representative of Christ to the world. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that you are an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador, that you're representing Jesus to people who don't know Jesus. That's your job. That's my job. We don't get to sign up for it. It just is because we're followers of Christ. And the only way that we can represent Jesus well is to be people of integrity. So here's what uh, I want to do. I want to ask three questions. They may be painful. They may be a little awkward. may be uncomfortable. But I really pray that you don't answer these quickly. But I pray that you would answer these over the next couple of days, maybe a week, maybe longer. That you and God would have a conversation about your life. About your integrity. Because every one of us who's a follower of Christ is on a journey. Right? We're on a journey following Jesus. And, and God has put his Holy Spirit in us and he is teaching us and he is changing us. He's growing us in that character of Christ. And so I want to give you kind of a simple integrity test that you can wrestle with. And you and God can have a conversation. It doesn't matter what your answers are to me. What matters are you and God having a conversation about your life and who you're going to be and how you're going to live. So here we go. Question number one. Do your actions match your stated values? Do your actions match your stated values? You declare that you're a follower of Christ. Do you live it? You see, we believe the Bible is the word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. Does your life match up with the commands, the principles, the wisdom of the word of God? Are you, are you reading this and saying, hey, I've got to try and do this. I've got to try and live this. Do your actions and your words match your declared allegiance? Do you, do you realize that when you decided to be a follower of Christ, you declared allegiance to Jesus? 
that he's your master, he's your king. That's what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. And so is your life matching up with your allegiance? That was one of the really interesting and cool things about Thailand. If you became a follower of Jesus Christ in Thailand, everything changed. It, 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 it changed your whole life because as soon as you confessed Jesus as Lord, you had to go home to your house and you had to throw away your idols because they have household idols. And then you had to go outside in front of your house where all your neighbors can see it and you had to tear down your spirit houses that you have erected so that the demons who live there will be happy. Yeah, that's how it is. Every house in Thailand, every public building, every uh, business has these spirit houses for the local demons because they're trying to appease them so that they will help them and not hurt them. It's a very lost, very dark country. And so the Christians have to tear those down. And a lot of times that irritates the neighbors because now you're going to anger those local demons. And sometimes if you're not the, the head of the house and you go in and you throw away your idols and you declare that you're a follower of Jesus, your family throws you out because now the local spirits won't come there because there's a spirit who has more power. That's the spirit of God who's in you. And there are people who are ostracized from their families and are ostracized from their communities. So to follow Jesus means that you've got to seriously mean it. There's no halfway followers there. On the other hand, America is a country that is immersed in Christianity. There's people who call themselves Christians who don't even have a clue who Jesus is. And there's all kinds of people who are using the name of Christ. And it's really easy for us to come here and say, I believe in Jesus and I'm a follower of Jesus. And then go home and play with our idols. Do your words and your deeds match your stated beliefs? What about your words? Are you speaking scripture into people's lives? Are you encouraging them? Are you building them up? Are you blessing them with your words? Or are you destroying people with your mouth? You know, it doesn't work really well to, uh, you know, encourage someone to follow Jesus if you're also asking God to condemn somebody to hell. A little inconsistent. And it doesn't really do any good to say to someone, hey, you should come check out my church and, and learn about following my God if you're cheating them in your business. And there's a lot of people who use the name of Jesus to try to make a profit. Speaking of profit, does your bank account back up your faith? Because Jesus talked about being generous and challenges to give. And here at Calvary, we take that really seriously. We, uh, we actually practice what we preach. And so when you give a dollar to Calvary, we give 21 cents of that away to mission causes. 21% goes away to missions. Because we want to be generous. And by the way, when you give benevolence at the door, 100% of that is given away. But we come in here and we sing songs of praise to Jesus and we declare with our mouths that we love Jesus. Does your checkbook scream, I love Jesus? You see, it's a matter of integrity. And if we're going to represent Jesus, then we've got to reflect his character. Question one is, do your actions match your stated values? Question two are you honoring God in your relationships? Are you honoring God in your relationships? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus went on to say, a new command I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. So in other words, we can't really represent Jesus. We can't uh, uh, represent him to the world unless we embrace this ethic of loving people. It's that simple. So are your relationships honoring to God? Here, let me be really blunt. If you're abusing your wife and kids, the answer is no. If you're cheating on your spouse... The answer is no. Even if you're just flirting on Facebook, the answer is no. If you're stealing from your employer, the answer is no. If you're a mean, nasty, grumpy person to everyone you meet, okay, even half the people you meet, the answer is no. 
Well, somebody's being grumpy. <laughs> so, you see, a life of integrity demands that we care about people beginning with the people that God has entrusted to us, our homes. If, if we're nice to everybody outside of our home and we go home and we treat our family terribly, then that's not a life of integrity. Or if you just care about your family and you don't care about anybody else in the world, that's not a life of integrity representing Jesus Christ. So husbands, are you trying to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Wives, are you respecting your husbands? Parents, are you investing in your children, teaching them right and wrong? Are you being the kind of employee that people want to hire because you represent Jesus? Are you honoring God in your relationships? Do your actions match your stated values? Third question. What are you hiding? What are you hiding? In Celebrate Recovery, they, they talk about you're only as sick as your secrets. Love Celebrate Recovery. They, they're all about transparency, uh, all about telling the truth. And, and here's the thing. It is impossible to live a life of transparent integrity when you are afraid of discovery. If, if you're coming here and you're hoping and praying that people don't find out what you're really like, who you really are, what you've really done, where you've really been, because you're afraid that they're going to exclude you or judge you or condemn you, then you're spending all of your energy trying to hide and therefore you can't spend any energy serving God. And especially you can't do it joyfully, right? Because I think there's all kinds of unhappy people in churches who are just worried that the people around them who happen to be just as messed up as them don't find out how messed up they are. And there's no joy in that. There's no power in that. And, and there's no freedom in that. You see, confession sets us free. It allows us to experience the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. And it allows us to receive the love of God's people. You see, when you're hiding, you can't love anyone and you can't experience love. See, because you're afraid of discovery, and perfect love casts out fear. But when you tell the truth about who you are, you can be loved by people, and you can love them in return. And I already told you that we're all messed up around here, and we're not afraid of your mistakes. We're not afraid of your past. We're not afraid of your present. Because we know that God has the power to redeem your life. And God's not afraid of your mistakes either. He loves you completely. So what are you hiding? Are you the same person in public and in private? Because Christ came to set you free and we want you to experience his mercy that just overwhelms you. We want to see your life redeemed. We want to see God build your integrity. Because we're all on this journey following Jesus. And he wants to heal your pain, but it's going to be awkward and uncomfortable for a little while. So this week, will you have that conversation with God about your life, about your integrity, about your character? And if you're willing to do that, know this. God doesn't expect perfection. But he is looking for improvement. And if you ask him to, Jesus will improve your life. Are you willing to take that risk and do that? Because then God can change you and God can change this community. Let's pray. Father, it is amazing that you know everything about us and yet you still love us. So help us not to be afraid to bring all of our filth, all of our trash, all of our past into your presence and help us to just sense your love and your mercy today. As we confess our weaknesses, help us to rejoice in your strength and your power to change our lives. And Father, grow us into men and women of God, men and women of integrity. Lord, there's some uncomfortable conversations we need to have with you this week. Give us the courage to have them. And change us from the inside out. 
so that we can be those lights shining in the darkness, so that we can be those people pointing others to Christ because they see you in us. God, thanks for loving us in our flaws. Thanks for the mercy that covers over all of our sins. We're rejoicing in that today as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.